Miles did. Well, well, thanks a lot, Corey. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow that. Um, I'm Chris Curl. I'm Vicky's youngest son, um, Francine's youngest grandson. Um, just before I get started, the, this morning in, in my hotel room, uh, my eight-year-old daughter came up to me and said, uh, good luck and, and do a good job with your speech today, Daddy. I said, oh, well, thank you. And then she looked at me and said, if you don't, they're not going to listen to you. <laughs> I said, great. Have a good day. <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Michael Nance, NamUs, and the University of North Texas. Everybody's been really kind to us. Um, we've had a great experience here so far. Beautiful facilities. Um, and I, I know there's tons more people I need to thank, thank, but thank you so much. It's it's really been amazing how how we've been treated. The last several years uh, for me have been filled with a lot of different emotions: uh, sadness, frustration, confusion, but mostly hope. Until recently, my my entire life um, was was different. I have a different story than you know my mother does, than Corey does. Um, my entire life was was spent not knowing my grandmother. I, I'm 32 years old, so I never actually met her. Um, I never met my aunt Karen. She had committed suicide before I was born. Um, so it's a different side, I guess. Uh, different different telling of the story. Um, a lot of the same things as Corey was saying about, you know, growing up, going going to, to Oklahoma and, you know, having those, the adults were having their, their awkward conversations and as a child you don't understand and you don't know exactly what's going on. I do, however, remember um, when, when I would stay home and my mom would come home <clears throat> on several several different trips from Oklahoma, uh, just the you know the angry and uh, frustrated feelings that that she had, even though she didn't talk about it necessarily with me, she was broken, completely broken down from from years of uh, not getting answers, from years of trying to find someone that would help her to to have any sort of break in a case that just sat and nothing happened with basically <clears throat> by the time i was in my mid 20s uh, i mean i'd like to i'd like to say that i always kept hope and and i was always um, positive about it by the time i hit my mid 20s i I really was pretty skeptical that that my grandmother would ever be found. Um, I mean, I, there was still that little bit of hope, but but when your entire life has been spent with nothing but that frustration um, and watching other people suffer because of what's happened, then you kind of maybe it was a defense mechanism. Maybe I mean I wouldn't say I give up. I think I just I just kind of blocked it out so I wouldn't have to feel that anymore. Luckily, uh, my mother and my brother never gave up that hope, thankfully, and for uh, Pastor Quentin to light that fire um, inside my brother is, is truly just amazing. He, would, he was like a crazy person. He would stay up all the time. That's all he thought about. That's what he was doing. Um, he'll, he'll be modest if you ask him, but this None of this would be possible if it wasn't for my brother um, and his relentless pursuit to find answers, to care. Um, you know, that's, that's something, obviously, as a family, you all care about your loved ones. Um, usually the trouble is finding the right people to care about your loved ones, to be in the right position um, so, that, so that something can happen. Um, 
you know, the, the people in this room, the University of North Texas, I, I'm just so grateful for everything that everyone has done. It's really a miracle, and believe me, the rest of the world isn't like this. Not everybody cares. That's, that's you know, what I want to get across to people is this is real life, this is real families, um, and we need, we need people to listen to us. We need, we need other people to care. Because as families, we can't do all of it on our own. We can't. We, we need that help. We need exposure, and we need to make people realize that this is missing. People in America is an epidemic. It's just not talked about. Maybe if we got more exposure, people would see, you know, how big of an issue this really is. Um, as Corey said and I said earlier, um, after my grandmother's disappearance, my, my Aunt Karen took her own life. Uh, and I, I never did get the pleasure to meet either of them. I've always felt a strange connection with them, you know, as I'm, I'm sure anyone would with, with family members and, and looking at pictures. And, and, and you know, it's, it's really be honest it's really sad for me I really wish that I could have been able to at least meet them but there is there is a silver lining um, and the silver lining is that my grandmother was identified um, we have we had my aunt Karen's remains and then they they were buried together um, after after 35 years which to me is just is simply amazing and and I attribute that to to a God thing, myself personally. Okay, so now that I've got the hard stuff out of the way, I'm going to tell you a story that I find humor in. Hopefully, you guys find humor in it too. If not, it will probably offend you. Um, the story is about the day that we learned that our grandmother and Vicky's mother's remains had been identified and, and we got that news. We were, I, I happened to be off that day. My mother runs a daycare in McPherson. She, she called me. She's like, Chris, I need you to come over. I need you to help me and watch the kids. Um, there's a police officer and a chaplain that have just pulled up. Um, so I just need you over here. McPherson's not a very big town. It's 15,000 people. So it took me three, four minutes. I drove over there. But on, on the way there, I'm, I'm panicked. Uh, my brother works in Wichita. My grandfather's 80 years old. I'm thinking, my God, who's, who's died? So I get over there. Um, and these, these two men, the officer and the chaplain, were standing and, you know, with very somber looks on their faces. And they, they pulled us over to the side in the backyard because they had asked my mother if there was anywhere that they could go. And my mother said, there's a backyard full of children. No, we got it. <laughs> I don't have anywhere to go. So we, they pulled us aside. Um, and they looked at my mother and they were like, uh, Mrs. Curl, I'm, I'm very sorry to tell you, but we have found the remains of your mother, Francine. Uh, now keep in mind that we already basically knew that, that this had happened and it had been 35 years, so we had a pretty good idea that Grandma was deceased. <laughs> But after they said that, I looked over at my mom and I go, oh, thank God, that's great news. <laughs> and I could, uh, I could see the chaplain and the poli police officer and the looks on their faces. I'm sure they've never got that reaction when they've told someone that their loved ones had passed away. So we were laughing and hugging and, and they asked, well, would, would you like 
would you like us to notify anyone else? I said, God, no. You'll scare them to death. They're going to think somebody actually died. <laughs> but just thought, I thought that was a good story on a, you know, kind of a lighter note. To, uh, to close out, for me, um, I just want to say God puts us in, in situations that I don't pretend to understand. He gives us a life that isn't fair. You know, it's full of hatred and misery. But it's also full of patience, love, and hope. And then he lets us choose how we react to every situation that we're in. Today, my message to you is, is to show you all love so that hopefully you will continue to hope. And, and we'll just be praying. We'll be praying for your loved ones. We're more than willing to talk to anybody about anything they want to talk about. We love you all. And thank you so much for having us, and thank you for coming. <laughs>